Hi, I'm Susan Bonilla, the CEO for the California Pharmacists Association. I invite you to enjoy this interview by Assemblymember Aguiar Curry of one of our CPHA members, Dr. Marilyn Stebbins. They discuss the need for California pharmacists to be involved in the COVID-19 testing. Thank you. I am Assemblymember Cecilia Aguiar Curry, representing Assembly District 4, which entails six counties. Um, you know, I represent the rural communities, and so um, one of my initial things we ever did, Dr. Stebbins, is that I took my whole entire team out to go see what it's like in rural California. Mm -hmm. And we all came back with a whole different sense of what's important, and the number one word that came up all along was access. I mean, as you know, in Yolo County, we've had... Um, numerous uh, events with coronavirus. We've had testing done. We've had deaths. We've had just about what every other community has, maybe not on the same range. But Good morning. I'm Marilyn Stebbins, and I am a resident of Yolo County and uh, was the first Yolo County COVID case. I am a pharmacist and uh, am a faculty member in the School of Pharmacy at UC San Francisco School of Pharmacy. I'm a resident of uh, Yolo County, but I actually work at UC San Francisco in the School of Pharmacy. Pretty amazing, surreal experience in the last two months being the first COVID positive patient in Yolo County. I got to experience firsthand what COVID was. Mm -hmm. And as an early patient, I'm somewhere between patient number 69 and patient 102 in the country. So as we look at uh, now over a million, I was a very early case. So a lot of what I saw was us scrambling. Knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. And I had knowledge. I'm a healthcare provider. I know how to work the system. And I came out incredibly disheartened knowing that the majority of people are not. And how would someone else navigate this system and understand it and not be terrified? Um, I fear for because of access and because of the lack of understanding of this crazy pandemic. Right now, we haven't had a lot of cases, outbreaks, and so there's a sense of um, power in those communities thinking it won't happen to me, and I don't want it to happen there, but it makes me, fear it makes me fearful is how to express um, my thoughts, the, the things that we have seen, the data that's out there to express this in a way that they get it. Um, and sometimes you wait until something happens to them personally, right? Right. Before it comes to the surface. And so I just wonder about, you know, what can we all do? What can we do as uh, for friends or as a government agency? Or how can we learn from your experience? You have to help me with that. Yeah, you know, I think, first of all, I would look at myself as the last person to get this. Yeah. Um, I'm a healthy 58-year-old female who is, does ultra marathons, so I'm I'm not what I consider to be the candidate, the likely candidate to end up in an ICU. I consider myself a middle-aged person, not an older person, and so I think a lot of people who are younger or middle-aged feel that it's not going to happen to them, and we clearly know that's not true. Important to understand why we're sheltering in place. And I think that that's the key. It feels like a punishment, and it's not a punishment. It is um, really, really incredibly important, and how we open back up is critically important. And again, that knowledge piece comes in there, and we as a society, as a government, as local agencies, we don't have the knowledge yet that makes us capable to open up safely because we don't have the ability to know who's had COVID, who's been exposed, uh, who's an asymptomatic carrier. And so people could be walking around feeling perfectly healthy and spreading the virus mm -hmm. and um, don't know it. And when we think of our rural communities and we think of our farms and our ranches and we think of our food supply, we absolutely need those folks. We need everybody working when it's safe to work. But if this virus spreads, there won't be workers, you right. know, because it doesn't take much for it to spread. So many places are looking right now at, oh, my goodness, we have very few cases. And that's what flattening the curve is. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. really slowing it down, but it doesn't mean that um, you get to go about your business. It means that we continue this slow, um, you know, slow way of life and sheltering so that we don't overwhelm healthcare systems so they can take care of people. So I think it's, it's the response, people have to understand the responsibility of their local and state governments to ensure their safety and ensure the safety of the public from this pandemic. Also understanding the need to work Mm -hmm. and people's um, need for a livelihood. And I think that the more we get out and talk to people and let them meet people who've had COVID and who've been sick and who potentially spread it to people they didn't even know, right? I have no idea where I got it. And um, so we really need to understand that and figure out what what it is. And I think one of the keys, and Governor Newsom in his six, you know, key points for reopening, really it's very important that testing happens Mm -hmm. so that we can do surveillance and figure out what the landscape is so that when we find people who are positive, they can be isolated and can be watched to ensure that they don't get sick. And that's the only way we're going to reopen safely is to know our environment. And I think that opening too soon without that is going to lead to quicker spread. It's going to lead to our numbers rising again, back to sheltering in place with more restrictive um, you know, means. And I think people, if we do it safely and responsibly, we can phase it in, we'll be much more successful. But we need the testing. Yeah. Um, you know, it's always a, a dilemma about the testing because people say, well, who should have it and who shouldn't have it? And, right. you know, and even myself, you know, I, I the dilemma is going back to the capital into a confined Petri dish, as far as I'm concerned, yeah. I'm to make sure that I don't get it and making sure I have the right PPEs to even go into the building. And so I think we're all um, uh, a little bit, st- I'm stressed when I think about that I've got to run over and go to a meeting. One of my biggest frustrations was testing and not early on because I didn't even think there was a possibility of having COVID. I thought I had a flu Um, because I was so early. But now it's incredibly frustrating for people to feel like they have a symptom and be unable to get tested. And just to be told, please go home and self-isolate for 14 days is um, a non-answer. I mean, it's it's really what we had to deal with because we had a lack of testing. But now that we're seeing more available testing, um, you know, I think I know in Yolo County, we now have Woodland doing testing through May and through June will be West Sacramento. Right. And that testing is available to anyone. Right. And so no longer do you need that physician order and you don't even need to have the symptoms because that's the surveillance that we need. Mm-hmm. Now, how do we get that to our rural communities? You know, I feel as though that's the key. And as a pharmacist, I have to say I'm incredibly frustrated with the California um, Department of Public Health and their interpretation of our state law not allowing pharmacists who are are within five miles of any person, you know, in the country um, and is a ready workforce to test. You know, we do testing already in pharmacies. We give vaccinations. We're healthcare providers. Patients know us. The community knows us. You don't have to set up a tent with people you don't know. We have a pharmacist in every community that could be doing this surveillance testing, whether it be the serological finger sticks or whether it be the swabbing for um, for the asymptomatic positives or people who are positive. And the fact that that isn't being allowed, you know, is really frustrating. And on the other hand, the governor is developing a whole new workforce to go out and do this. When we already we, have a workforce. We have work. a workforce and a very, very educated workforce that right. can also talk about it, can talk about the disease, can talk about, you know, the misinformation in treatment, what's correct and what isn't. And, um, you know, many people say, but I don't want to be walking through a pharmacy if there's sick people coming in and out. 
Well, guess what? There's drive up testing everywhere. Right. You know, you don't have to do testing within the pharmacy. You can do it out in the parking lot. Right. I've been tested now eight times. Yeah. And it's <laughs> the last five times have been outside. Yeah. So there's not a problem. But we really need to get this going so that we can open up. But we can't safely open up without this information. And if we do, I fear we're going to shut down again and we'll shut down in a restrictive manner. Right. You just enlightened me because it just makes so much sense is to use our already trained workforce that's out there to use this. And um, that is a good question that I'd be more than happy to put forward. I mean, that these are the re reason we have these conversations is because as much as I think I know so much, I really don't. I like to ask the questions and find out what's important. Um, one of the things that we did find out is that we did a telehealth bill last year, and it is very successful, ironically, with the pandemic. And uh, I have a really good friend of mine that um, is a doctor in Vacaville. He saw 18, had 18 patients in one day. Four were face to face, and the rest were telehealth. Yes. And he was able to help them without bringing them into um, into the uh, office itself, and you know, make sure no one else gets sick. And I thought, you know, if there's a timeliness and opportunity, was the telehealth bill, and to be able to move that along and making sure that people had still had access, it was helpful for many of my rural friends as well. Um, and as well as we have a telepharmacy bill that we've done as well, so that right. some of our smaller pharmacies can expand to a satellite. Right. So, you know, we're trying to look at um, medical um, and look at anything um, related to access for rural c communities every which way, including this year we were attempting to do a telepsychiatry um, bill. Which I saw was, that. This year's a little bit odd because we have so much in our budget that we have to deal with. But, you know, sometimes you want to go, money shouldn't be the issue. Let's get to the solution. But we all know where that is. So yeah, anyway. it's a fascinating number at, at UCSF. I think so many providers have been more afraid than their patients to use telehealth. It's also somewhat threatening to think that your patient doesn't want to come in and see you <laughs> um, to a provider. But we went from about 2% at UCSF to 60%, now approaching 70% telehealth right. and televisits and video visits with our patients. And, you know, it can be done. And so thank you for your efforts in that area. And let's move those efforts into getting community screening and education in our pharmacies. Your rural communities really, I will tell you, their pharmacies are, are their lifeline. Right. And when you look at the, the untapped healthcare professional in a pharmacist that could be so useful in this pandemic, and, and it will take an executive order from the governor, but guess what? Governor Cuomo in New York, he put in an executive order and we have, you know, I think 17 states that have done that so far because uh, it needs to be done. And when I look at California and I think of how progressive we are, we're behind. And uh, we really need to take this seriously. Um, we absolutely do. You know, one of the things I, I just like to bring up is that, um, Initially, when you your story was told, it was inaccurate. It was yeah. not, and it was frustrating, I'm sure, to you. I read that, and I thought, you know, um, Marilyn may not be happy about this article. Um, how do we make sure the right story gets out? The whole point was I wanted to tell my story so that people could understand who I was and that anyone can get COVID, right? I'm not an elderly or excuse me, an older woman with underlying health conditions. You know, everybody who knew me thought I was, that person was sitting in a, in a nursing home, right? And that's who we thought at that point really got sick from COVID. So I wanted to set the record straight. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of misinformation that happens early when people are scrambling. Right. Um, I was fascinated by, the sto by your story. Um, I must admit, I, you know, every morning I kind of reflect <laughs> about all the people throughout the nation who has gone, have gone through this. Um, and I can't even imagine how your family were yeah. when you were sick. And um, I feel like there must have been some loneliness without being able to see family and loved ones during that period of time. Um, would you mind sharing a little bit about that? Sure. I think, people I think that's, don't realize they, that. They don't. And I think the other thing they don't realize is how isolating it is for family. Mm -hmm. So for me, um, again, People kept saying, you must have been so scared. I said, well, I think I was too sick to be scared. And when you're isolated and you're sick, mm -hmm. you have people caring for you. Now, granted, those aren't 
your loved ones around you, but I have a really nosy family and they were constantly, you know, and I'm from one of nine children, so I have a lot of siblings. <laughs> and so people were, you know, definitely keeping in communication, but I felt re incredibly, um, I felt like my husband was really left on his own and to fear, right? Because you, you can't be there. You drop somebody off in an emergency room and you don't realize it's the last time you're going to see him for nine days. Yeah. And you, you, it's not happening to you. When it happens to you, you have a sense, some sense of control, but those around you and family don't. And it's incredibly isolating. People are working as hard as they can to keep you well, and they're not always communicating to your family. Yeah. Right. And you're not always able to communicate to your family. So I think that is an incredibly frustrating thing that I think we have to learn how to care for family and caregivers during this pandemic because it's incredibly isolating for them. Mm -hmm. For me, I think the most, one of the toughest parts was you feel like, you're a virus, right? You're not a person anymore. And oh my God, who am I going to infect? And it was incredible guilt over every time I'd say, oh my God, you drew the, you drew the short straw. You have to come in and take care of me today. <laughs> and they were so wonderful. I can't thank my UC Davis staff enough and my UC Davis PCT who were phenomenal. They never, ever felt that way. They were so wonderful and they would laugh about it. And, but you're stuck in an, especially in an ICU, you're in a glass box. I would never had to be on a ventilator, but everybody around me who didn't even have COVID at that point was on a ventilator. Right. People can't come in and out because of PPE. And, you know, it just the kindest little smile through my window by a housekeeping staff or a nurse or a pharmacist to wave. I had a, a, one of my previous students was the ICU pharmacist who would wave to me in the window and, <laughs> You know, it, it's, I think we always talk so much about protecting people's privacy and HIPAA. And yeah. Really, when you're in a hospital like that, you need somebody to look at you and acknowledge your humanness and to smile. And we're so into privacy, people like look away or they're afraid. And we have to, we have to remember the patient and we have to remember their family. Yeah. And I think that this disease and this pandemic brings that to light because it is so isolating. Right. Well, Marilyn, um, it's been a pleasure to chat with you. Um, you've opened my eyes on a couple of great ideas, um, but also just from your heart, what you've seen. Um, a young man from Woodland, um, actually, he works as a lobbyist. He yeah, was really sick, but they said he was negative. And he had uh, all, he had all, he was in bed for days and days with yeah. 100, 104, and he was home with his family. And he told his story on Facebook, and it broke my heart because he felt like when he first went in the hospital, he said, I felt like I was um, E.T., and I went into a blue room, and there was nothing on the walls and nothing. And he said, fear. No went, TV. <laughs> nothing, nothing. And he goes, my fear went through me. And so um, I am so glad that you were um, sharing your story. Um, you know, the, your family, I thought I, my heart went out when I read the story. I'm thinking, oh, my God, what is the family thinking through this whole time? And I think about a thing that I work with a lot is with children and yeah. the trauma some of the children are having is not being able to see their grandparent again or, you know, a wonderful relationship. And then all of a sudden it just goes away without the final hug or the kiss or whatever. And so yeah. it just was um, overwhelming for me to hear some of these stories and to hear yours. And I am um, honored that you spent some time with me today um, and um, I'll take your story back. And I'm hoping that, um, um, Ms. Benia and the team will be sharing your story. So thank you so much. And, um, and don't forget the pharmacists in your communities. Oh. I think we've got to get that executive order and we've got to, if we are going to open it up, we've got to get our trusted healthcare professionals that are accessible, um, able well, to I, be part of the public health solution. And I do know I have my staff on here that are writing notes left and right. So we will keep take writing. Keep writing. <laughs> but I, I, I totally get that. It makes so much sense. We have a workforce already. Why are we going out elsewhere? I mean, come on. Right. Thank you. Well, thank you and very keep, much. Keep up the fight. And thank Everyone. you so much for all you do. Yeah. And if you yeah. ever think of a great idea that I need to work on, please call me. I'd be honored to Absolutely. work Absolutely. Thank you also. Yeah. So oh. much, Assemblywoman, for, for meeting with me yeah. because I think uh, we're in a really unprecedented time and you taking the time to meet with constituents is 
really impressive. So thank you so much.